welcome all to the return to in-person luncheons of the League of Women Voters of Monterey County. It was three years ago that we were able to be together in this room and I'm completing now my second year as president and I have not previously had the honor of presiding, so thank you very much. I want to um, welcome you on International Women's Day. Uh, yeah. I will just make this comment as I have to a few. Um, it has not been finalized by the board, but um, I know we're glad to be together in person and it looks as if we will be doing a split next year, very likely having some Zooms that enable people to participate who cannot come or cannot take the time, um, and also some speakers who might not be able to come here, but also, um, and we're hoping to have maybe half the meetings in person again too, so that's what we're looking forward to next year. Our speaker, Michelle Welsh, Professor Welsh, or Mickey, depending on how familiar you want to be, um, has, certainly has a very distinguished resume. She is now retired from her law practice, um, and in, which was focused on employment, education, and civil rights law. She is a, a professor of constitutional law at Monterey College of Law, and that's what she'll be focusing on, that knowledge in her address today. But she has a long, illustrious uh, resume of leadership in this field, um, especially through our local ACLU and the state ACLU. And um, I just have to say, I don't, I can speak extemporaneously, you know, I don't need a note for every word, but this <laughs> person's list of awards, really, I have to go to the paper. And I will not be able to include everything because then there would be no time for her to talk. But just a few <laughs> highlights. She received the Medgar Edwards Freedom Legacy Award from the NAACP Monterey County branch. She has received the Lady Justice Lifetime Achievement Award from Monterey County Women Lawyers Association, the ACLU of Northern California's Lola Hansel Courageous Advocacy Award, the Chief Phil Gibson Award for Community Service from the Monterey County Bar Association, Outstanding Women Award from the Monterey County Commission on Status of Women, Baha'i Women's Rights Award. I'm not even gonna go on further because I know I'm just embarrassing her. <laughs> we should make the time out simple. So it's a great honor to have her speak to us on what's going on in the Supreme Court and what the implications might be for us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. You know how much I love to talk about the Constitution, if you know me at all. So let me say this. Oh. I don't like to be confined to a mic, but I'll try to stay close to it. I'm here facing this direction for a reason. For the past 30 to 50 years, many of the court's most important decisions are egregiously wrong. And for that reason, the analysis and the mode of deciding Supreme Court cases, especially those in the area of fundamental rights, must be changed so that judges are no longer free to just impose their own political views on our entire country. Or, the Constitution is a living, breathing document. It was in, intended to endure for the ages. It must evolve as society evolves, and it must change as society changes. And the interpretation of the Constitution must acknowledge the times we live in and not be hidebound to what people knew and believed and the status of equality and liberty and justice in 1787, or 1791, or 1848. So which is it? <laughs> that debate between originalism and non-originalism has been going on for now a couple of decades. 
and particularly intentionally and knowingly for the last 20 years or so and embodied mostly in Robert Bork, if you remember him and his writings. And Justice Scalia was probably the most influential in having originalism, as it's called, take root. And now, for the first time in our history, we have a majority on the court of judges who identify themselves as originalists. And they intentionally came up with this doctrine in order to stop much of the progress, in my view, that the Constitution was assisting our country in achieving in areas of individual rights, women's rights, racial justice, equality, environmental justice, consumer protections, employment protections. The intent to roll back the interpretation to bind it to what they now call original meaning means that we go back, and especially after the decision in Dobbs made this very clear, Dobbs versus uh, Jackson Women's Health, that the interpretation by the Supreme Court majority right now is going to look at what the Constitution meant in 1787 when it was first ratified. Or in 1791, when the Bill of Rights was ratified, or in 1868, when the 14th Amendment was ratified. And that's the meaning that the Constitution will have for us today. When we look at rights, it's in that framework. And this, among other interpretive methods, will prevent our Constitution and our ideas and concepts of liberty and freedom from expanding. Put the brakes on. Judges will not be able to decide that there are more rights than what are listed by name in the Constitution. So this is a, a time of fundamental change. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you. I have identified various themes, a few themes, that I want to focus on today because we don't have time to talk about everything and I want to leave a little time for your questions. But the first theme that came to my mind is reducing or restricting federal election regulations and oversight. And the first case, of course, that comes to mind when I think of this effort and the pending cases right now is Moore versus Harper. You've probably heard of that case, maybe not by name, but that's the independent state legislative theory. The independent state legislature theory is one that actually was, I don't know if it was started, but it was made more prevalent by Justice Rehnquist in, of all cases, Citizens United. You remember that case, where he said, that there is no jurisdiction for the government to be monitoring election issues because Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution leaves it entirely up to the state legislature. And so this theory, which has now come forward in Moore versus Harper, because the Supreme Court of South Carolina invalidated its own political gerrymander that was put together by its legislature in South Carolina and ordered a different map to be made. And of course the politicians who drew the map didn't like that and they said we're the legislature. It was up to us to make the map and the court has no jurisdiction even though the state constitution in South Carolina prohibits political gerrymander. And as you probably recall, a couple of years ago, the, the Supreme Court in Rooker versus Common Cause held that the Supreme Court itself cannot hear cases of political gerrymandering because it's a non-justiciable political question. And so no one, no court anywhere 
could hear a political gerrymander case. And that would be the goal, to establish the independent state legislature theory in its most extreme form. And there are other forms that are lesser than that, that are also being argued, but they make no sense. Because if the legislature isn't a single body, then it makes no sense to say that it controls and the court has no jurisdiction. And here's why. Because already, every state has a legislature that passes laws, but the governor has to sign it. So if the governor has to sign it, and if the governor doesn't sign it, it's not a law. And also, many states like California have an independent commission that draws the, the districts for congressional elections. And those have been accepted by the Supreme Court as valid, even under the Constitution as it stands, saying it's the state legislature. So if you accept those as part of what comprises the state legislature, meaning legislative system, then saying that just the legislature gets to decide on a political gerrymander or on a congressional district, and the governor can be involved, and the independent commission can be involved, but the court can't. So it makes no sense. So I don't know what the court is going to do with Moore versus Harper, but right now the fact is maybe none of us will find out what the court would do in Moore versus Harper because just the other day on March 3rd, the Supreme Court asked for more briefing on the issue of whether the Supreme Court still has jurisdiction over the case because meanwhile, back in South Carolina, the judiciary on their Supreme Court was replaced with conservative judiciary who now are going to rehear the underlying gerrymander case. And that means that there is no final state court judgment for the court, the Supreme Court, to hear. So it may not be Moore versus Harper, but you can rest assured that the idea and theory of independent state legislature will not be forgotten. It will come up in another case. So stay tuned, but we may not be waiting for Moore versus Harper, even though it's already been argued in the Supreme Court, it's ready to be decided. By the way, Ju Chief Justice Roberts loves to have reasons not to decide. <laughs> because he, he often, tries to mediate or, or do something with these very, very difficult, challenging cases, uh, a little like herding cats, like happened in the Dobbs case. But um, he may take that opportunity, or the rest of the justice may go along, and just not decide Moore versus Harper. But we also have, as part of this similar effort, this theme, Merrill versus Milligan. And that is the challenge to the Voting Rights Act Section 2 that has to do with racial gerrymandering. Now, the court decided in Rucker versus Common Cause that they wouldn't hear political gerrymandering. But much earlier on, the court held that racial gerrymandering that violates the Equal Protection Clause is justiciable and the court will hear it. And that was even before the Voting Rights Act. Now, the Voting Rights Act specifically prohibits uh, race discrimination in voting and specifically provides that when there is a district that has certain criteria for minority representation, then the court may order a majority minority district. Many of us have heard of these majority minority districts. And that's what's being challenged, that authorization to order majority minority districts. And Again, this is trying to invalidate that section of the Voting Rights Act that protects against racial gerrymandering and provides a very effective and adequate memory, a me remedy for racial gerrymandering. And if the, success, the, the parties suing succeed in Merrill versus Milligan, uh, then the standard will be, would the same district have been drawn without any consideration of race. And that is an entirely different standard from looking at the composition of the district, the racial composition, and whether or not they could ever possibly elect their own representative. So that standard, if changed, would 
uh, would certainly change the prevalence of racial gerrymandering. It would, in <laughs> essence, impose an intent requirement when right now the Voting Rights Act does not require an intent to discriminate, it just allows remedies for the fact of discrimination. So we'll see where that one goes and hopefully uh, the court will render a decision that upholds the Voting Rights Act. That brings me to my next theme. My next theme is the colorblind constitution. We have heard that phrase used. Uh, these days, the majority of the Supreme Court does adhere to the idea that the Constitution is colorblind, meaning that no consideration of race can ever factor in to government action, legislation, gerrymandering, anything else. You cannot consider race. It is a direct frontal attack on all remedial action to eliminate racism. All affirmative action, as it's come to be called, and all considerations of race in any context. And here is where this is coming up. Merrill versus Mulligan, I just told you about. It comes up in that case, that there should be no consideration of race in districting. And if there is, it will be invalid. After that, we have pending right now, and I'm sure you've heard of some of these cases, Students for Fair Administration versus Harvard, combined with Students for Fair Administration versus the University of South Carolina, both of which are attacking the use of race as any criteria for admission to college. And the reason there are two cases is one's a private institution, Harvard, and so they're trying to invalidate Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which allows consideration of race. And the other, the University of South Carolina, is a public university, and so the Constitution does directly apply to it. And that would be alleging that considerations of race in admission violates equal protection and the Fifth Amendment. What this does is request that the court overrule two Supreme Court cases, Gutter versus Bollinger and the University of Texas, case where the court held that the state has a compelling interest in a diverse student body. And because the state has a compelling interest in having a diverse student body in colleges and universities, it passes strict scrutiny to allow consideration of race, not as the only factor, but as a factor in college admissions. If these cases succeed for the Students for Fair Administration versus Harvard and South Carolina, that means that any consideration of race whatsoever, regardless of whether it meets the strict scrutiny standard, regardless of whether there's a compelling interest in diversity, any consideration of race will violate the Fifth Amendment and Title VI of this Civil Rights Act will be unconstitutional. So this is huge, and it will mean the end, the total end of any kind of affirmative action consideration. By the way, we already have a proposition that passed in California that prohibited consideration of race in public employment and public education. So we're already um, dealing with a lot of that in California but other remedies have not been precluded. Okay, I'm trying to cover a whole lot of these things real quickly. So I'm moving right along to my next theme, which is the big one. Elimination or reconsideration of all unenumerated fundamental rights. We have enumerated rights like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from unlawful search and seizure, Fifth Amendment protection from self-incrimination. Those are stated in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights. By the way, those are interpreted nowadays, as we saw with the Second Amendment in the uh, New York Rifle Association versus Bruin this past term. Even the enumerated rights will be interpreted according to the meaning of the time of ratification of the Fifth Amendment, if it's a federal law, and that would be 1791. 
or the 14th Amendment if it's a state law, and that would be 1868. That's why we can't have gun regulation. So, uh, you know, what gun, re what gun re regulation did we have in, in uh, 1868? Not much. Anyway, the enumerated rights, even interpreted that way, are acknowledged and they will be upheld and in fact sometimes used, as I'll point out later, to achieve other ends. The founders were very concerned from the very beginning that if they started listing rights in a Bill of Rights, that those would be seen as the only rights we have. And therefore, the Bill of Rights didn't make it into the actual Constitution in its first iteration. That's why we have the Bill of Rights as amendments that occurred four years, five years later. But that's what's happening now. It is, in fact, being interpreted that way, that if the Constitution doesn't have it in text, it's not a right. How many of you have heard? There's no word uh, protecting abortion in the Constitution. There's no word privacy in the Constitution. But guns, yes, we have guns in the Constitution, so that will be protected. So the enumerated rights and the founder's concern that enumerating rights was going to be construed this way is coming to pass. The founders, in knowing that, added the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution in the Bill of Rights. In the Bill of Rights, it says, in the Ninth Amendment, enumeration in this Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. The court has held, though, that there are no Ninth Amendment rights. <laughs> But the Ninth Amendment is one basis for the courts finding that there are indeed fundamental rights. The construct here, I'll just say this real quickly, we spend classes on it in my, my law school class. The idea is that we have certain fundamental rights that are so fundamental that they constitute liberty. And we can't be deprived under the Fifth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment, we can't be deprived of liberty life, liberty, or property, but we can't be deprived of our liberty without due process of law. And it's on that construct and that premise that our fundamental rights that are not enumerated are protected, including the right to privacy. But how does the court now analyze these unenumerated rights? Many of those sitting on the court now in the majority have advocated against having any unenumerated rights. Justice Thomas, in the Dobbs case, in his concurrence, as you probably know, specifically said that the court must reconsider the right to marry for LGBT people, not, of course, for interracial couples, because he is in one. <laughs> <laughs> the right to private consensual uh, sexual conduct, that is, again, in an LGBT case, and contraception, Griswold versus Connecticut. So the court is poised, if asked in the proper case, to reconsider many of these rights that we have come to, to believe in and take for granted and count on. And this originalist versus non-originalist interpretation has completely changed the way these rights, alleged rights, or any new rights that we might wish to bring before the court will be considered. So eliminating, reconsidering, reconsidering in unenumerated fundamental rights. I need to talk about the Dobbs versus Jackson women's health case. That's the case that overruled both Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. They had to rule Planned uh, overrule Planned Parenthood versus Casey too, because Planned Parenthood versus Casey, Justice O'Connor, clearly went through the analysis of whether or not Roe versus Wade should be overruled and decided it should not. And so there now is a precedent that Roe versus Wade should not be overruled, that in Dobbs the court had to overrule. So in Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health, the court really did two important things. It changed the fundamental rights analysis, 
in a couple of important ways and it changed the way the court analyzes whether a case should be overruled to make it easier to overrule precedent. And in particular, I'll just say, by requiring the original meaning to be the interpretation of whether or not something that is alleged to be right really is a fundamental right requires us to go back to those years I mentioned, 1787, 1791, or 1868, and see what people meant by that right in those days. And then we interpret the Constitution that way. By the way, Dean Chemerinsky of, of the Berkeley Law School uh, points out that there is absolutely no evidence that our founders ever intended for us to be bound by what they meant or might have meant at those times. Nor is there any evidence that anyone meant that when the 14th Amendment was passed, the Civil War amendments were directly passed to try to end racism while ending slavery. And now they're being interpreted to <coughs> require us to go back even further in time and look at what, what people meant. By the way, also, I just have to say this, in the dissent in Dobbs, and I can hear Justice Kagan's voice here saying this, the people did not ratify the 14th Amendment. Men did. <laughs> Women didn't even have the vote until 1920. And it was ratified in 1868. So going back and seeing what people meant when they ratified the 14th Amendment is going back to a time where many of us, many of us, had no voice and no vote. So what happened in Dobbs in the analysis was also to use the most specific level of abstraction to define the topic. So the topic isn't, should we have the right to autonomy in making decisions as to whether or not to bear a child? That's one way to look at it. But no, the question is, does the Constitution provide a fundamental right for abortion? Specifically, very specifically. Not as Roe versus Wade held, is abortion included in a wider right to privacy that we all have as a fundamental right. So if you look at it very specifically, and that's the way the court will look at it with the majority we have now, we look at the very specific act that you're talking about and whether that constitutes a fundamental right. My other example that illustrates this very clearly is the difference between Lawrence versus Texas and Bowers versus Hardwick. Those are two sodomy cases where criminal sodomy statutes were challenged as unconstitutional and violating the right to privacy. And in Lawrence versus Texas, the question asked was, do we have a right as consenting adults to engage in sexual conduct in the privacy of our own home? What do you think? In Bowers versus Hardwick, the question was, does the Constitution protect a right to engage in homosexual sodomy? See the difference? When you ask the very specific question, oh, come on, the answer is no. Where in the text does it say homosexual sodomy? But when you ask the question broadly, and you look at the text of the Constitution, where in the Fourth Amendment we're protected from unreasonable searches and seizures, that implies that we have a right to privacy, doesn't it? Especially in our own homes. So terms in the Constitution give rise to the right to privacy being a fundamental right, though not enumerated. So Dobbs would change that using the lowest level of abstraction and also change how we will evaluate overruling precedent. And that includes, as I said in the first sentence, the case was egregiously wrong. If that's a criteria, 
for overruling a precedent. All that takes is for a judge to say so. And originalism, they say, is intended to limit the power of judges to impose their own views. And just saying that if a case is egregiously wrong, that's a reason to overrule it, certainly allows different judges who disagree with the ones that are made the original precedential decision to change it. And they're supposed to be using more firm, identifiable criteria. The other thing they did, reliance. Where people relying on Roe versus Wade is one criteria. And they used that same criteria, but they found that, no, people weren't relying on Roe versus Wade because pregnancies are unplanned. Abortions aren't planned. It's not like a contract or a property interest where this is important, people are planning ahead and the government needs to protect those plans. So they discounted all the 50 years of reliance on Roe versus Wade that women have, have had in this country, even though no one probably goes out thinking, gee, I hope I have an abortion someday. We've all known that it's there and it's available, even if it is a last resort. So in the dissent in Dobbs, they point out, and I say Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. I'm not sure who actually wrote it. I think it was a joint effort. This is a quote. Either the mass of the majority opinion is hypocrisy, or other rights are at risk, one or the other. They assure us in the majority opinion in Dobbs that they don't intend to go after any other fundamental rights because abortion is significantly different. After all, it involves a life, an unborn human being. And under that rationale, Justice Kavanaugh in particular in his concurrence said, so don't worry. Take our word for it. <laughs> but of course, in Justice Thomas's concurring opinion right next to it, it says, let's go back and look at marriage rights, the right to have sex, and procreation, and contraception, so we'll see. I could, and I have, talked about Dobbs for, <laughs> for hours, uh, so I will leave the question of Dobbs, uh, but, uh, but I am hoping uh, that the courts will temper their desire to go after uh, fundamental rights, all the unenumerated fundamental rights, and protect what we have come to rely on. My next theme is limiting administrative and executive powers, especially in the area of environmental protection, social programs, and consumer protection. And here, I hate to shift gears like this, but this is a different consideration, but it is also intended to come up with certain results. In West Virginia versus uh, Environmental Protection Agency last year, the court held that, that the EPA had no authority to regulate to prevent greenhouse gas. Remember that? And that was because, and this is a brand new rule, a brand new rule imposed by the court in that case. If a major question is presented, then Congress has to give very specific authorization to the agency to initiate regulations and institute enforcement. The major question doctrine never heard of before. And of course, the EPA didn't know it needed that. It now does. <laughs> but a similar issue is raised now with Sackett versus EPA, which is pending. And the question there is whether the Environmental Protection Agency has jurisdiction over wetlands. Because wetlands are not navigable waters. And therefore, there's no interstate commerce. And Congress has to be acting under its interstate commerce power, or it can't act at all. And therefore, there is no jurisdiction in the EPA to regulate wetlands, just navigable waters. That has never been the interpretation before now. But we'll see where that goes, especially in light of the major questions doctrine. The major questions doctrine has come up again. Just Was it just last week? in Biden versus Nebraska, the student loan forgiveness case. 
And that, again, they said, how can the Department of Education or the executive branch or even the president forgive student loans when that is a major question with large economic impact? So they're coming back to this idea that if it's a major question, Congress has to specifically, very specifically, authorize it. And of course, the Biden administration is arguing that they did, but it's not as specific as one might hope to meet their concerns under the major question doctrine. Okay, zipping right along, um, I want to also be sure to address, I have just a, a couple more here, expanding certain enumerated rights in order to achieve other results. That is broadly reading some enumerated rights. And here, under this category, comes the New York Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, decided last year that the Second Amendment interpreted according to its original meeting in 1868, because it's a state. States, uh, when you're looking at state laws, you're looking at 1868 because it's the 14th Amendment that protects our fundamental rights for state laws. This gets very esoteric, but it's the Fifth Amendment that protects our rights to be free from federal regulation. So it depends on which kind of law you're talking about, which era governs the meaning, which is also a little absurd, isn't it? Uh, so we have New York Rifle and Pistol Association limiting the government's ability to regulate and control guns. And that, in that case, it was carrying handguns, moving handguns around the city, found that the Second Amendment was violated. But we also have consumer protections like California's initiative that required animals to be caged in certain size of cages for their own protection. Remember that? The National Pork Producers Council versus Ross is pending. And that uses the concept of the Dormant Commerce Clause, that is that Congress has exclusive power to regulate interstate commerce, that that is violated, Congress's power has been violated by California's initiative requiring protection of animals because that protection affects out of state, uh, interstate commerce, out of state producers that want to import into California have to comply with that size of cage and so forth. So if the court decides that the, the Commerce Clause prevents California from enacting that kind of protection, then that means that the state, our state itself, can't institute that kind of protection probably anywhere, because if we force our pork producers to comply with it, but nobody else has to, guess where all the pork is going to start coming from? Outside, not from California. So that'll be an important case. But here is one extremely important area I wish we could dwell on uh, further, and that is the case of 303 Creative LLC versus Elenis. That is pending this year. And if you remember the Masterpiece Cake case, that is the case where a baker did not want to bake a wedding cake for a, a gay couple. Well, here we have a website designer that doesn't want to do websites for LGBT people because of her religion. In both cases, they were saying, my religious conviction prevents me from doing this. Both are raising their First Amendment rights as artists to not be forced, not be compelled to do art they don't want to do. In this case, it would be a web design. Some of them aren't that artistic anyway. <laughs> but this is the argument there, that because of religious views and religious beliefs that I should discriminate against you, I should be exempt from the laws that prohibit discrimination in my business or my school, or my service, or where, wherever I'm, uh, my employment. And so religious exemptions is a very large area that this court is engaged in protecting and expanding the idea of religious freedom, especially as, of course, as it pertains to Christians. This court also has held that, not this particular court, uh, with these justices as yet with Coney Barrett and Jackson being so new, but the court has held that the 
protections of religion are so important that they should be exempt from the non-discrimination laws. And that has been true in several different ways and areas. So that's an, that's an area that's expansive. And at the same time, the area of religious establishment of religion, the separation of church and state, is diminishing. So we have more tolerance, as we saw in the Boston flag case. You know, Boston was letting different people and, and organizations fly flag on a certain flagpole. And a Christian group wanted to fly a flag, and they said, no, that would be an establishment of religion. We can't do that because we're a government. And the court said, not only can you do it, you must. You must fly a Christian flag if you're flying anybody's flag. And that has also been true of the use of public buildings and such. Uh, if it's open for public use, it's open for religious use. So uh, we'll watch again for the court's religion decisions, especially in the area of school funding and things of that nature. Uh, for the first time last year, the court held that not only can a state provide funding to religious schools if it's providing funding to public schools, for the first time the court said they must. If the funding is being, being provided to, to public schools, it must be provided to religious schools. So that's the direction we're going in in terms of religious freedom. And that is, uh, that is some concern, especially in the area of non-discrimination laws and people being able to say, I don't believe I should I believe I should discriminate against you, so I'm exempt. OK, just a couple more things. One, along these same lines, campaign finance. You all remember Citizens United. Boo. And in, boo. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Citizens United, of course, the prohibition in the McCain-Feingold uh, a campaign finance law was struck down with regard to corporate donations. And here, the court did decide already, in this case, that uh, it's called FEC versus Cruz, that is Ted Cruz. In McCain-Feingold, it said, if a candidate lends more than a quarter of a million dollars to his campaign, like Ted Cruz did, then they can't accept donations to pay it back after they're elected because that looks like some kind of favoritism, doesn't it? I've got this big loan, could you help me pay it back? And I'll give you, of course, some kind of benefit. That was struck down as violating the candidate's right to receive contributions and people's right to make contributions. They didn't, expect, they didn't accept that it was an anti-distortion interest of the state that was sufficient to engage in that level of violation of Ted Cruz's First Amendment right to raise money, or my right to give him money. So there are numerous voting rights cases, as you know, all over the place, photo IDs, limits on polling places, mail-in mail ballots, eligibility criteria. So there's not time to go into all those. but. Frankly, I'd rather they didn't come to this Supreme Court. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, one last thing. I keep trying to get to the last thing. Uh, one last thing is these two cases that were just argued recently, Gonzalez versus Google and Twitter versus Tomei. Those are the section challenges to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which eliminates all liability of these big platforms for what they post. And this is a suit by somebody who was injured by things that were posted uh, and, and came to harm. There are two cases. The other one is that, that uh, Twitter violated the, the um, Terrorism Act, Anti-Terrorism Act. And the interesting question, one interesting question of many, because these are private platforms, so the Constitution doesn't apply to Google or Twitter. They can do whatever they want. The rationale of them not being liable for what they post, even though it might lead to terrorist acts, 
the rationale is that it's not their speech. They're just, they're just creating a platform and somebody else's speech is being put up on there. But nowadays, they all create algorithms that determine and that put content together and then they send that content to us, to people they think are interested in it, including people interested in terrorism, including people interested in violence. Does that become their own speech when they compile it and transmit it? And if so, why aren't they just as liable as Fox News? Why aren't they just as liable as a hotel who knows that trafficking is going on? Might they not be just as liable as anybody else doing the same thing when it's they themselves that are speaking? So it's creating a really interesting issue for the court to deal with here. Already though in oral argument, both sides, liberal and conservative, said, well, shouldn't we leave this to Congress? Well, you know what happens when they leave it to Congress. <laughs> Nothing. I guess we'll see what happens, but they didn't look like they were amenable to creating liability, and there's a lot of concern that if they, if they do strike down Section 230, that the Internet, as we know it, will change dramatically because the platforms, Twitter, Google, Amazon, whoever they are, will censor themselves because they don't want to be sued. And they're in it to make money, so they don't want to have to spend money or be liable for damages, and that the whole thing will change. And some people say, well, good. <laughs> it's about time. But a lot of people say, well, then Google or Twitter is in charge of what I get to say. Because right now, that section protects them from what they post and what they take down. They can't be sued either way. So that'll be an interesting one to watch. And now real quick, there are a couple of two lower court decisions that I want you to be aware of. One is the Mifepristone. I had to look up how to pronounce that. The Mifepristone case in Texas, it's at the very lowest level of court right now, but if that judge invalidates the FDA approval, then it could quite possibly interfere with distributing d this uh, medication abortion drug all over the country. Uh, right now, it's only Walgreens that won't, it may be some smaller pharmacies, but of the big pharmacies, right? Th th keep this in mind when you go shopping. Rite Aid and CVS uh, have said, we're going to wait and see what happens. Walgreens has said, okay, we'll stop. So they're not dispensing it anymore already, even though the, the court hasn't ruled yet. It'll be interesting to see what that lower court rules. Uh, it is a very conservative judge appointed by President Trump, so he may very well choose to, to rule that the FDA hasn't sufficiently, uh, in, they hadn't sufficiently considered the safety of that drug. And finally, really, I think I am at the end of my notes here. <laughs> No, I have no. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are concerned about the Equal Rights Amendment, and here we are on International Women's Day, the case to force the archivists to accept ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment has been dismissed. The court held that Congress does, in fact, this is just the Court of Appeal, so it could go to the Supreme Court, but the Court of Appeal held that and this is the case of Virginia versus Ferrero, that Congress does indeed have the power to set a time limit for ratification. It did set a time limit, and that time limit has passed. So unfortunately, it looks like unless some higher court changes that, the Equal Rights Amendment uh, needs to start all over again. So for those of us who worked for the Equal Rights Amendment in our day, pass it on to your granddaughters because <laughs> they're going to be working on it. Okay, uh, local implications are probably obvious. Uh, these cases are going to affect us all. And I thought when I was asked to talk about local implications that as far as what's local to us is that California as a state typically is far more liberal and does not agree with the direction the court is going. And what the court is doing is making it more difficult for the states to legislate in areas where we in California may want to legislate and that is consumer protection, anti-discrimination laws, gun control, environmental protections, 
and many of those areas where if the federal law preempts what California can and tries to do, uh, then we won't be able to do what we want here. And at the same time, other states will have more freedom to do what they want because it'll be consistent with what the federal law wishes to achieve. So that will be the most notable local effect except for the effects on us as individuals whose rights uh, are, are now placed at risk. So uh, what are the options? The League of Women Voters blog, I did review this in preparation for today, suggests jurisdiction stripping. Let's just tell the court they can't hear things. Now I have some concern about that. Even though I'm not a fan of this particular majority, I still am very concerned about Congress's jurisdiction stripping powers, which they do have under the Constitution in many ways. Uh, they don't have powers to strip uh, the authority of the court to hear constitutional cases themselves. That goes back to Marbury versus Madison. Don't mention Marbury versus Madison, they might change that too. That's the case, that's, <laughs> that's the case that said the Supreme Court has the role of reviewing the constitutionality of acts of the executive and legislative branches and of the states. So it's a, they better not overrule that one. Okay, I just wanna end by saying this. For those of us who want to eliminate systemic racism, stop environmental degradation, preserve religious freedom for everyone, expand equality and rights for all people. The originalist analysis is not for us. It must be different. And I want to read you in, in closing, just this this is a wonderful book I'm going to recommend to you. It's called Worse Than Nothing, The Fallacies of Originalism by Dean Chemerinsky. And it goes through in detail why originalism is full of fallacies and political motivations and does not, in fact, operate to restrain judges from doing whatever they want because these judges are now doing whatever they want as radically as anybody ever has in the past. But here's what Chemerinsky says, and I'm saying this to you because I can't say it any better. Now is the time to get past the debate over originalism and non-originalism and focus instead on a far more consequential question. What meaning for the words of the Constitution would advance the noblest goals of a modern, democratic, pluralistic society? And how should that meaning apply in specific cases? The Constitution has always been and will always be about balancing the majority's values against the values that should be protected from society's majorities. That is what every Supreme Court opinion concerning the Constitution should be about. So I'll leave you with that thought. Let's come up with a way that honors our modern democratic pluralistic society and protects the minority from the majority. Thank you, and I will take a few questions at this time. So wonderful. I, I wish it were a start of a seminar series. Amazing. So I want to respect everyone's lunch hour. I know that some people do have to leave, but I propose that we just have a very strict 10 minute limited time where Dennis Marr has graciously volunteered to sprint around the room and take a few questions just for, for 10 minutes, if that's okay. Um, Dennis, here we've got one more. This is the time when you play stump the lawyer, so give it a whirl. <laughs> My question is, you hear them talking about um, adding more Supreme Court justices. How, do you see that as a solution or is that not a viable solution? So if I read about it, hear about it, or have to vote on it, I would have some information. That's an interesting question. Uh, Roosevelt tried the court packing plan a long time ago and finally thought better of it when one justice changed sides. 
So we can hope for a miracle like that to happen again. <laughs> but the League of Women Voters blog, I didn't have time to go into this, did recommend as another thing besides jurisdiction stripping, uh, changing the number of justices. I have very mixed feelings about that. It's been nine justices for over 100 years, even though there's nothing in the Constitution that says how many justices there are. We can count on it becoming a political hot potato, and every president that comes into office, every Congress that changes, will change the, the composition of the Supreme Court to suit their needs. I say that at the same time I have very serious desire for different justices on the Supreme <laughs> Court. <laughs> so I just think if that is to be done, it's going to have to be done very, very carefully and in a very measured way and possibly there are some other remedies that may be more effective. Do you believe that Citizens United will be overturned? By this court? No. Uh, I, I think that campaign finance is being tried all over the place, especially public financing, which has not been held to be unconstitutional, the public financing of elections, and various other alternatives to these huge super PACs. So public financing and disclosure laws were upheld by Citizens United. So I, I think we'll have to go that route because I don't think it's going to be overruled. Follow up on the question of reforming the Supreme Court. If by some miracle the Congress were to pass uh, term limits or conflict of interest rules about the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. you believe the Supreme Court could simply invalidate that? Congress could, could do that. Congress must create a Supreme Court, but other than that, and other than the original uh, versus appellate jurisdiction provisions in the Constitution, there's nothing else that says how the Supreme Court should operate. So Congress does have the ability to regulate more about the Supreme Court than it has ever done before. Uh, but right now, with the stalemate in Congress and Congress's inability to do anything, I doubt that that's going to be something that happens anytime soon. Right, but could the Supreme Court then invalidate that as not in accord with the original intent before me? They might try, but somebody would have to file a case <laughs> to do it. It'd be interesting to have the Supreme Court suing the Congress. <laughs> in fact, I think it would be a non justiciable political question, don't you? <laughs> um, question over here. How did the Supreme Court skip over the separation of church and state in order to approve public funds for charter schools? They didn't see much need to deal with the separation of church and state. The, right now, there's three different ways to analyze the Establishment Clause, and one of them is the accommodation theory, and they all they all buy into the accommodation theory, meaning this is a religious country. Religion is important to us. Religion is, is so important that the government must acknowledge the presence and importance of religion in our lives. And therefore, very few things actually violate the Establishment Clause. Under that theory, the only way the Establishment Clause is violated is if somebody is, is actually coerced to practice a religion or to believe a religion or if a religion is actually established. In other words, tax money, it is tax money, but if tax money is going to religion itself. And so it used to be that if there was tax money going to a religious school, it couldn't be used for religious instruction, uh, but even that has been watered down. This last uh, case, one of, one of the two last cases, <coughs> involved playground resurfacing. And so the court couldn't find any rational reason why playground resurfacing material couldn't, you know, funds for that couldn't be provided to the religious schools. So, so didn't they, when they ordered the state to offer it to the charter schools, isn't that an order and that's more than a combination? Uh, yes. The last decision of the court, that just last year, required that, it, well, it found that the state was discriminating against the religious school by not providing the tuition assistance funding. 
Tuition assistance was being provided to private schools, but not to religious schools. And for that reason, they said they were discriminating against the religious schools. And so I had to provide tuition reimbursement to all private schools. Okay, I think we, I think we have to wrap it up. You have to enroll in Monterey College of Law. Or <laughs> I'm very proud to say that Mickey is a member of the league. And so if we can get her to come to some of our in-person lunches. So it was fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'll see everybody online for the April meeting and in this room for our March uh, for our May membership meeting. Hoping. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.